How y'all doing this evening? This is Evan with Underhill Bonsai. We're over here in Folsom, Louisiana, and this is Third Thursday Live. And this evening I have uh, Dana Quattlebaum with me. He's from Arkansas. Hey, everybody. And uh, we're gonna be working through some American Hornbeam this evening, just talking about general care, uh, how to collect them, and how to, how, basically how to train them here, and things that you need to consider when working on American Hornbeam because Dana can definitely attest that they are a very finicky species. They're very finicky. They're yeah. one of the most finicky of all American bonsai, except for maybe American beech. Um, dying back is a major problem. But with this type of plant, don't give up on it because it has issues. It makes a very good bonsai for us to work with. And plus, they're readily collectible. And if you don't have a place to collect them, you can always call Evan and hook up with the Underhill Bonsai and get you a nice American Hornbeam, which he's got a bunch of out there. This one, we chose it today because it's got lots of branches on it. Um, it's got a little bit of taper, but not much. But we're gonna see what we can do with it and maybe bring out a decent bonsai in this in an hour or so. Look at all that moss on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's just to deal with them being all jammed up together and getting a lot of shade in the right time of the year and then moss grows. So we're just gonna remove some suckers. We're gonna leave some extra branches and then we'll start cleaning this trunk with some brushes here. So uh, you want to brush air? Yes, sir. And um, we'll get all this off of here. But one thing we wanna do say about these trees is they are very water hungry. They are a waterborne tree. Anywhere that there's no water in the woods, there's also gonna be no American hornbeam. You might find beech, you might find elm, but you're not gonna find American hornbeam. So when you get this plant home, you wanna make sure that you give it plenty of water and then repot it every couple of years. An older one, you can go three years or so without repotting it. If it's in a larger training pot, maybe five or six years. I've had some that were six years in a big training pot and they were screaming to be repotted. And of course, you have to learn how to hear them scream which means read your tree. This one, as you can see, is extremely healthy. Um, at home, mine are barely coming out of dormancy. Down here, you guys are yeah, we're a, a month and a half out of dormancy, basically. Yeah. So they're really vigorous growing right now in the spring. They've had their spring burst, as you can see, and just healthy as a horse. So what we're gonna do is clean this trunk up so we can see a little more of it and then do a little work on it. But like I was saying, when you get ready to repot your American hornbeam, what you want to think about is what type of soil mix to use. And that would be something that retains enough water to carry it through a 24 hour period without having any drought issues because that will cause you to have issues like a branch dropping off. Also, when you're watering a tree, you know, when we water our bonsai, we water every square inch of the topsoil, which means the backside. So if you're standing away from your tree, showering it from this direction and it hits the pot here, the backside of this tree is not getting any water in the pot or very little. Eventually what will happen will be a dying branch above that area or possibly a complete area of the trunk that may die back due to how it's watered. So whenever you're considering American hornbeam or any of your bonsai, always think about how you're watering your trees and that you sufficiently water around the topsoil, filling it once or twice or maybe three times if it's a very thirsty tree like American hornbeam is. Yeah, a lot of this moss that's on this trunk, because we have them out, this tree was collected two years ago was and it? Uh, it was collected by Benson Green and uh, <laughs> it actually sat back there for a while and I, I did a little bit of, I hedge pruned it a little bit to ah. kind of chase the branches back. And you see the carving that I did here, just a little bit of, get that chop. At the top, yeah. Yeah, I did a little bit of carving there. So I did a minimal work on this tree, and then I set it in the back again to let it keep continue to grow. Um, it's got so, extra top in there too. Yeah, it's got a couple of things in there that we could work with. Uh, hmm. So, but it's still relatively raw. Um, very, very much so. So yeah, all this moss that's growing on this trunk is just from, like Dana said, it's like they were crowded back there together 
We got overhead water system hitting them all day long. So yep. Yep. perfect environment. And then wintertime moss grows the best in winter. It'll die off in the middle of summer because of the heat. But even though you're watering it, it's just so hot, they decide to, oh, I'm gonna wait till winter and it actually goes dormant. So that's when you can get in there and get the moss off even easier when actually, it's dormant like that. I'm gonna remove this wire and get that uh, wire did cutter. I, a wire cutter? Yeah. Uh, right here. Thank you, sir. There you go. Just so you, we can get it off of there. And... Yeah, I've already taken one off of this side. And these trees, two years in a pot, eh, you can definitely it's remove this full. wire. Yeah, and it's it, full of roots in there right now. As much foliage as it has, it's developed at least that many roots, probably fairly packed and wound around the pot. Uh, so what do you guys feed normally with your American Hornbeam 7? Uh, we're normally doing like a balanced feed. It's 13, 13, 13. Um, it's a slow release fertilizer that's usually available to, uh, to nursery settings. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a pretty it's commercial, strong. Commercial grade. Yeah, commercial grade stuff. Gotcha. Um, but, but that's I mean, very good to use. And it's excellent to use. And you can actually get stuff that's comparable to it. Um, but it slows down its release when it gets warm out, when it's really hot. Mm -hmm. like it has 90s, a, in the like 90s. a wax coating on it or something. Polymer. Polymer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very nice. Very nice. That's the same thing I use uh, over the last few years. A good commercial grade. Uh, what I've been able to find is a 15% nitrogen, which is a little bit high, but you know, it's a 9.6. So it's got, the last number is very good because I don't want to give it too much potash. And so uh, kind of tell us what you're doing there. You just kind of- I'm just kind of cleaning it up, trimming it back a little bit. Okay. So I can see a little more inside, just clean it up. Get them out of my face and your face while we're- And we know that these overly long branches we're not gonna really need. All this stuff right here is just way too leggy for now. So we're gonna shorten it up a little bit. And then we'll get in and put a little wire on and see where we go with this tree. Because there's more to this tree than what we see with all this. Now you can actually see a little bit of the trunk there. Yeah. Inside of here. And I still haven't decided on the front for this because you know, it's, I looked at it for five seconds this morning. So oh, I've tried this one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we've been working on other stuff all day. So bald cypress on the mind, but American hornbeam tonight, that's all good. Mm -hmm. uh, bonsai is all what we make it. And these trees can be some fabulous bonsai. I've got really nice ones at home, readily twigged out. These can twig out within three years to almost show quality with proper pruning and training and rewiring every year. If you rewire this guy, it will really become a nice tree. And all these twigs will set. And so like leaf reduction and stuff like that is pretty easy on this species. Huh? It's already doing it to itself. You can see the large leaves on the outside and the smaller leaves on the inside. It's got big leaves out here. A lot of those I'm cutting off, but when I leave that, it's got real small ones inside. So it's already doing it to itself. Mm -hmm. And I don't even worry about that because as I get it ramified, it's going to make the smaller leaves in itself. Because this is just a solar panel. All these leaves are just solar panels. When we have less branches, we have large solar panels. When they get more branches, they get smaller solar panels, but many of them. That's how we get them small, tiny leaves on the trees that have big leaves out in nature. And it's a simple thing. It's just a balance of energy, really. Yes, it's redistributing that energy. You're exactly right. <clears throat> So this guy here, we need to put a couple wires on it and decide on something else for the front. Where Let's we're gonna see. use the front on this. So do we wanna catch this branch that's dropping down here? That one there may Cause it's coming go. out the base of this branch mm -hmm. here too. But do this one being so straight up. Yeah. And that's something that folks should see and, and recognize right here. This one is much more difficult Let's see if we can get a shot of that. Yeah, Doug, come down a little bit with that, that camera on there. Down where my fingers are. Yes, you sir. Go. You see this one's going straight up and down and almost at perpendicular to the trunk. The one you have is coming out laterally out of the trunk. So actually, even though this one is larger, this one's a better branch to use if you were gonna put a branch in this area. The reason is this one's probably gonna crackle and break on us when we bend it down, even though it's very flexible. Plus, it will have an arch 
shape to the branch coming out of the trunk, which we don't want to use that. We want one that's give us a more lateral descent so. out of there. Yes, and, and this that's will, a really good little branch. And this will grow really, really good because it's already got plenty of vigor. It's got a good and advantageous bud at the end here. It'll be this big. In probably about a year. In two years. Oh, okay, you about know, two years. You got this summer and by the end of next summer, which would, to most people, that would be one year, but it's actually two seasons of growth. It'll be that large mm -hmm. as long as we don't constantly prune on it, constantly prune on it. We're all susceptible, myself included. Trim, 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 trim. Sometimes it's better when we're training a tree to let them grow a bit in between our work, to not constantly keep them in show quality mm -hmm. trimming. Okay, so that's an important thing to know as well. But yeah, that branch there, if we're gonna use this area as the back of the tree, it'd be better to use those smaller ones. But I'm still not decided on where the front is. What, what, what's your idea on that, Mr. Evans? Well, because because generally the rule of thumb with bone size is that you don't want it to feel like it's falling backwards or falling away from you. Right. Um, you usually want to use the, a section where it, it does kind of go back a little bit, but and then the comes apex forward. comes over the top. That's right. So that's right. maybe we can even try, oh, there's a wire. Oh, mark. that's a wire scar. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I did put a piece of wire right there. Yeah, that had a wire on that one. But it got real thick. <laughs> but, but anyways, um, the, uh, the point would be to probably try like a wood wedge see if we can change the probably angle a little block bit. it and see if we can get it to where i kind of like uh the spread here and this branch selection here mm -hmm. it's, it's a very clean front over on this section which is right off the corner of the pot but like you say wood blocking sliding it back moving it like so will make changes it. everything for the tree yeah because then you get this there's a root back here Yes. That you get. It's dark because of how wet it is. Right. And we're a little shading it out. But there's a good root here. There's a good root here. One in the front. And and there's, got, there's a lot more of them under the soil that we won't expose tonight, but will come out as the trees potted yeah. into a new pot, new container, et cetera, et cetera. I could see so if I have a wood. There's a lot there. going on with this tree that we can't see because of all this foliage. Yes, we could defoliate it, but it's a little bit early in my book for doing a defoliation. Um, I've had a lot of questions about defoliation with, with particular <laughs> species. Yeah, you're laughing because you know where this is going. What, when can you defoliate hornbeam and deciduous trees in general? That, in your opinion, because you've worked with it. And American that's one thing hornbeam, we need to cover. What I do with the American hornbeam is, to answer your question, to my best knowledge of how these react to defoliation, they don't like to have a full defoliation. Mm -hmm. What I do with them is I'd give them about a 70% defoliation, taking off all the large leaves, which are these guys, these big guys here. And these are so fleshy right now, they haven't even totally hardened off yet because these are late comers for spring. The Trident Maple's the first guy out. This is like third out of the chute. So I don't defoliate completely on them. I do take a good bit off so they get a lot of light to the interior of the That's tree. Because in the summertime, they can drop a branch real easily by being shaded out. I'm just looking so, for something to stand as that long tree as you're with. not taking all the foliage off of them, they should be fine. But one thing about defoliation, everybody, if your tree looks funny, if it doesn't look happy, if it's not singing, I'm pretty and beautiful to you, that means don't defoliate at all. Because if you defoliate during that period, there you go. <laughs> I like that. There, there we go. There we go. Let me step back just a second and get out of the camera shot and take a look. See, yeah, that's pretty good there. And it's a, Let it's a pretty out. blunt tree because. Oh yeah. It's, if it's, you look at it, it's. You were looking for taper this morning. It's yes. relatively one it's, thickness. It's not. It's not much taper. But <laughs> like you say, we can carve a wee bit on it and stuff like that later, um, which we could carve on it this evening, but. I don't want to throw chips everywhere. <laughs> We've had enough chips today. Uh, but, you know, it was up a little bit high. I want to get that fairly level mm -hmm. through here. That way we have a tree that's got a foundation. In all bonsai, we want to make sure we have a foundation. And it's got a really nice base. Look at that. You guys get as good a base as just about as I get up there. Mm -hmm. And so you must have bedpan clay under these yeah. when so they're... When Tell they're growing. When you dig these trees up, because you, 
We've, I've got a lot of your stories of digging out American hornbeams. And if y'all didn't know, uh, Dana, how long have you been doing bonsai? Uh, 25 years. 25 years? 25 years now. And how long have you been uh, digging up American hornbeam for? Uh, about 10 years or so. so. You know, and, and it's a, the first five years was learning the trees because I knew that they had an issue with dying back. So when I started collecting them, the first batch I collected was just above knee high and wound up losing about 40% mm, of the trees due to dieback. Because when it starts to die back, if they don't have a branch in their node that's actually ready to pop out on the opposite side of the tree from where they do have one that's growing, that side will completely die all the way to the root. Mm -hmm. So that told me, next time I go collecting, pocket high. So every one I started collecting was at least as high as my pocket. If it was larger, uh, trunk, I would like three inch trunk size at the top, I would even go a little into my chest. But then I stopped collecting those because they have a real tendency to die back because they're older. The older the tree is, the more it wants to die back. And that's why folks stopped handling, stopped worrying with collecting American hornbeams. But look how beautiful this is. Oh yeah, I mean, it has glowing. a gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. leaf on it. Uh, in the winter time when it's getting freezing outside, and you don't protect it. If you notice, if Mr. Doug has gotten in and looked at these twigs, how red they are on the tips. These especially, look at the top, how red they are. Yeah, zoom That's, in right there. Yeah, that. it's really, really difficult to see in the camera maybe. But it's, but it's bright nice red. red. Mm -hmm. The hardened off twigs in wintertime also have that red color to them, especially if you let them get frost and frozen no problem they can handle a lot of cold uh, in fact i have a pad that's got about half a dozen on them sitting in pots like this on the ground mm -hmm. negative two let's see when that was that was the same time y'all had your what 10 degrees here it was roughly 12, about 14 to 16 14, degrees 16. i yeah. wish i could have had that <laughs> but we but we had the the cross winds oh the and they wind were is horrible yeah that's that's wind burn with cold is even worse because it can burn the bark off a tree yeah. it's amazing how it can do that but these guys here they're really cold tolerant so you sh should never have to worry about protecting them during so any cold winter weather. protection is not a huge deal with these trees not down here no yeah even even where i'm at, at where we got negative two i mean we for five days straight we got not above 30 degrees mm -hmm. I mean, it was frozen, the ground was pushing up, all this kind of stuff. And these trees, of course, I went out, we had, luckily we had snowfall with it, and it came out there to about 12 to 14 inches deep in some areas of the driveway, and I piled it onto the trees to help protect them, given that igloo effect, and they had no problems with that. So that's a really, really nice base to it. It doesn't have a lot of taper, but it does have a little movement this way little movement that way so that's good and this branch is another one going straight up and then luckily these Here, sucker up I'm gonna turn it around yeah there you go it's growing straight up but luckily we have two branches to choose from underneath it so we're gonna cut that one off okay gonna get rid of this straight guy is this not gonna be the top of the tree so we don't need a new top and that yeah we'd rather bye -bye. be a twiggier branch yes exactly and I see some nice carving you did there Got a little yeah. hollow in there, I see. I did a, I did a little bit of experimental stuff with this. That's good. Um, it, it was, at the time, a little bit higher than this, and it was very bluntly cut in here. But yeah, there's some, there's some like, uh, I guess what you'd call like a shell of dead wood uh, from the front side of the tree. And then I did, like Dana said, there's a punch through the tree here. It's probably not gonna be very easy to see. Um, it's got a couple of webs in there, so I'm hoping that's ah. good, good spiders. Yeah. It looks like a yeah. little tiny spider. Yeah, nobody that's going to hurt anybody, I think. No. You know, the good thing about having spiders is they're taking care of the pests that you don't see. Yeah, the tiny <laughs> stuff that we literally can't that's see. That's right. So, you know, never worry about a spider unless you see itty-bitty spider mite webs on your trees. Then you have to worry. And, yes, spider mites like American hornbeam. Uh, let's see what else likes American hornbeam is white flies love them. Yeah, um, you know, all the good pests love the tasty trees. And this tree is one that doesn't tastes get a whole lot of problems from pests, but so it doesn't taste good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Occasionally, I see spider mite damage a little bit, but not much. And usually, 
a few scale here and there, but that's the normal thing with any trees. Uh, now, one thing I will say, if you have Japanese beetles or have experienced Japanese beetles in your area at all, Japanese beetles love them. And how can you tell when Japanese beetles have been around? They do. They do that? That. Here, we'll, we'll zoom that in. Is that, so that's... Um, it could be, but I don't think it is. But get that's zoom in on that similar leaf. to what they do. Straight in the center. That looks like a caterpillar right, chew. Here. Just like that's a caterpillar chew right there. So right in here, there's a couple of holes, but there's a yeah. more prominent hole in that leaf. Perfect and, hole. <laughs> yeah, like a perfect, almost perfectly round hole in there. Mm -hmm. And that, like you said, that's indication of the Japanese beetle. Usually. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's a, is that a bug? Are you familiar with how the bugs eat on the leaf? They kind of suck out the inside of they the leaf? Just, they just make little holes all over the leaf, and they'll leave actually the webbing, the structure of the leaf intact yeah. at the end. There's of a it. name for that. Instead of, there's another beetle or another bug that, it's probably just the caterpillar, because I see my crepe myrtles will see this every once in a while. Yeah, they like and crepes too. <laughs> and you'll see, the, you'll see the bite come out of it like an apple. Yeah, and they'll like this right here. Yep, there's another one. Oh, that's, that's one, perfect. That that's one's got the one bite I was marks showing. in it. Yeah, yeah, it looks like somebody's teeth marks in that you guy. You want to show that one too? I'm telling you, that's amazing. So come in. That's why I pulled it off and set it there. I'm like, oh, I got to show him this one. It's really a neat little, I mean, it just looks like a perfect chomp. Yeah, you can actually see where, because the way that the caterpillar eats, its yeah. mouth is like nip, nip, this, nip. really slow, and it goes in those big circles, and you can see it in that leaf. So. Uh, what do and you that's do? That's probably is, what did that. Hole what do you as do well? as far as in, uh, was for like treating for pests? Then what's your your methods for well, American hornbeam and pests? I like to use granular because spraying, you know, you're, you're spraying a lot of other things that you don't want to spray sometimes. And I have pets, et cetera, et cetera, that like to run around. So if I'm using granular, so you're I'm granular concentrating it into one plant, et cetera, et cetera, systemic, et cetera. systemic granular. Okay. But the problem with that is, and uh, I was informed by a good friend of ours about how it, some of these like merit can affect the bee population. Yeah. That one bee can take the and poison back to the hive and kill. So I've had to be very choicy about what I use. A very flowering plant that's tasty to bees, I don't put it on it because the chemical is active four to six weeks straight. Hmm. And that is way too long to be putting trees out there with poison on them that could harm the bee population because uh, bees feed the world, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they really do. There's been a lot more exposure about, about the wild bees and how we're losing them slowly. Yes. Um, a lot faster than we would think, I'm telling you. Yeah. And you so know, yeah, be when real I was a kid, we would see bees everywhere. Every clover patch. Now, hardly any. you have to look for bees to find them. It's amazing that the population is like that. And I love to see people that are like beekeepers taking their hives out to farmlands that are organic, growing, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just getting some of that out of there so it make it easier to wire it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that, that's helping the bee population in itself and keeping everybody fed by pollinating uh, farm crops and what have you. But mm -hmm. it's also very important for us to be conscientious of that particular thing. That's why... I, I'm very choicy about what I use my uh, merit on. Uh, other than that, I would say orthene, uh, like your fire ant killer, it, that's also a systemic, but it's acephate. And I don't think it would really harm the bees if you were using that. So like just your regular fire ant killer mm -hmm. will take care of the beetles too? Yes, it'll okay. take care of the beetles. It, it's a systemic, so it gets inside the plant. And then there you have everything yeah. you need. When it chews on it, it says, oh, this tastes nasty. If it doesn't kill it, it doesn't come back. And it tells all the rest of the population, don't, don't go to this. this one. This one tastes terrible. So yeah. that helps you and the plants that you're working with. Because when you get damage on your trees, you can't take them to the show. Because you have to sit and pick all the leaves. Next thing you look at, oh, you ain't got no 50% leaves. <laughs> of my leaves are gone from damage due to insects and pests. But, you know, it's not something that we have to be extremely concerned about unless it's damaging the health of the plant as well so just you know keep in mind prevention is worth a pound of cure every day so that's all we can do about that is keep putting a little bit here and there mm -hmm. if you like to spray there's lots of things out there there's malathion i'm just wondering if that might be a little dead spot but I don't and this think is so. an, another thing that i was going to look at with with you with this tree dana is that 
I can see a clear cambium roll. Yeah. And you could probably bring it in yeah. right here in this spot, Let me Doug. Clean that up just a hair. Move it towards the camera. Towards the camera, like. And if you zoom in right there, can you see? Yeah, there you go. There's a clear That's cambium weird. roll right here. Yeah. And so it kind of ends right here where this deadwood carve is, obviously. And so, Dana, tell us about I how, think, like. I think you might even have. You can more see it. Wood down to here. Can you see it a little bit yeah, where it bubbles see, out a little bit? I can bit? see the, the hump right here. Yeah. The camel's back right through there. So that means right under here is going to be a dead area. Yeah. And that's okay. I mean, a little deadwood a tree got broken in a storm, and that's what happened. And then it grew back this new top. It's kind of like cypresses and everything else in the world. Uh, when they get sheared off, they just start over and make themselves anew. Um, so that's not a problem. This could be all the way to the bottom. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. It's yeah. lovely you, that it's not. So, what do you think is the the likelihood that it is dead? Oh no, I the think it's only dead to right here in this V, that V shaped right there. Okay. That's the only dead part of it there. I was just looking at this because sometimes in little spots it'll do the same thing. It's well, yeah, that live vein. I don't want to keep going with that, and so it'll. It does look like a little bit out in one or two areas. There's a piece of bark right here. It looks like it's sitting yeah. over the top of a scar. Yeah, that might. Do you want to gin pick it off of there? That might be something that I could do. Yeah, here. Let's see if it's gonna be. Yeah. And it looks like it actually no that that's dead that little dead right in the center just right but there. But just a bear and a little stripe of it. You can see the brown on that one, the green right here. You see that. Yeah. Differences. It's hard to probably see that on the camera. Oh no! Like oh, if I can get these leaves. That's actually alive right there. Look at that. Yeah, and this is one thing that we that's need to make great. sure of with with these American hornbeam is that there are going to be dead zones that are not obvious because yep. I mean the bark almost looks exactly the same as the live section, but you can see, like Dana said, there's a there was a, a bump in there. Yeah. That that indicates the live vein of the mm -hmm. of where the tree is actually still mm -hmm. feeding up here. You and sometimes, and see. yeah, brown. And he's scraping here, and it's brown wood and it's there. just dead right there. Yeah. yeah. So that you just buff off with a sanding wheel, a little wire wheel, and it, it'll give you the grain in it and everything. Treat it with the, you know, the PB PB petrifier, and that will help. If you like lime sulfur, make it a dark lime sulfur. Don't make it bright white, mm -hmm. um, which means put in some India ink and. A little couple little additives of maybe some silver and a little drop of black paint mm -hmm. with it. And that'll make it dark like it should be. Because on American Hornbeam or any other deciduous, you don't want bright shimpaku, even pine silver. You don't want that. You want it to be a little darker, so, more natural. My question to that you then, Dana. Good there. I like that right there, what you did. Is something that comes up a lot in the old school bonsai books is that never have deadwood features on a deciduous tree. And I know, I know, this is... It's a new thing, though. It's something it's we have something to talk about. starting, you yeah. know. And how can you not when they offer this to you? I mean, why not make use of it? Instead of having a big, big scar spot... hole, yeah. Yeah, that's going to hollow itself out. Why not protect it? I mean, for instance, the privet hedge. Everybody's using it in Europe. They love it. I like privet hedge as long as they're healthy when they start having dieback issues then it's time to toss it and go to another one because it doesn't work sometimes uh, but what you have to do it has a real easily rotting dead wood so you have to treat it with a wood treatment otherwise you just have something that you just created and spent hours and hours and hours carving and then you have nothing in two years because it rotted away like that so tell us like this what's... wood here is two years worth of What's the uh, so what's the 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 technique or the or the get prepping the dead wood so that you don't lose it because you're going to lose well, it eventually over time right but how do you preserve it even longer I've seen folks that have had privet for instance to you know not to break the subject but that's fine we have to use an example somewhere and not many people are doing horn beams and not many people are doing them with dead wood on them so you use something else that you know it has a similar easily rotting wood and privet is one of those. Twice a year it gets lime sulfur, once in the spring along with the petrifier, mm -hmm. and then the second half of the year it gets another coating of lime sulfur, and it keeps it stable. Yeah. Otherwise it rots away. And what's the chemical you're using to stabilize? Uh, it's a, just called PB petrifier. 
that's uh, readily available at yeah. stores. I saw some around here somewhere. Oh, I had a, I have a couple you have of bottles a bottle somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's something that every bonsai enthusiast or any bone, anyone that's creating bonsai from yes. collected material should have on hand. Oh yes. Because I mean, if you're not going to heal up a scar, then you need to use petrified or a wood hardener. That's what it is like men wax, but it's way better. It, it proclaims that you can take, put it on a windowsill that's rotten and, and revive 24 that 24 hours you can drive a screw into it. Because it's plastic. Because it turns it into plastic yeah. basically. So it's a very good item to use, but the drawback is, such as lime sulfur, when you use it, you gotta wait for it 24 hours to dry, put it on, let it sit in the house where no rainfall, no dewfall, no water hose is going to get to it. Because once it dries, you need to rinse it and rinse it through your soil. Because if it gets rainfall, if it gets any type of moisture to it and it drips down the trunk, it always goes right to the main roots and right out to the tertiary roots, which will burn them to death. So you must rinse and then flush your pot. What I mean by flush your bonsai pot is give it four to five to six full waterings, complete waterings to where it fills up and drains out to flush that chemical out of the tree, then you're okay. But if you put it out there after you've treated it right back out in the nursery, in about three to five days, you're gonna notice things happening with your leaves, which are always an indication of something wrong with your roots and and so on and, and so forth. And then we start the crying process. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so then you lose a section of your root system in the you tree. Can use you can lose the tree. tree. Yeah. Whole tree. Because Usually it's the entire tree because it, it webs infiltrates out. every little section because it just follows that water and follows the path of the roots. So there's the problem. You know, so once it gets on it that out. trunk, it goes down yeah. and follows those roots right out to the edge of the pot. So Always it's flush it. I've made that mistake a couple of times long time ago and saw shimpaku juniper just drift away that i'd spent 12 hours Working designing and wiring <laughs> oh, tertiary man. branches and then <laughs> later on you're just crying and go what did i do wrong then you have to figure out what you did wrong exactly and if you can get that everything's downhill from there yep it's all easy. And I then maybe you'll tweet. start making some more bonsai trees. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's no problem. You'll keep making bonsai trees. You just, you know, have a moment of stalling and going, okay, what did I do wrong? That's the point where you come to and you're like, do I really want to do bonsai? <laughs> <laughs> Been there and done that. Yes, yes, yes. I know the feeling. Be really, really wrapped up in a tree. And that's why a lot of people that come into the nursery, they ask me, how many trees should I have in my collection? And I say, Forty. Plenty. Plenty of trees. <laughs> Forty. Forty yeah. is your number? <laughs> no, that's just like one of the standards is you should not have more than 40. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I've oh, got... That's a standard? <laughs> that, like that, that's something that's said like, that's like shop talk almost. It's yes. like how many bonsai trees does a professional have? Forty? Or no, a given collection. Not a prof I'm sorry, not a professional like, you a know. A like... given collection is normally, you know, anywhere from 20 to 60 trees. That, and that's typical of what you've seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and for you, on your, in your nursery, you're caring for hundreds. About 600-ish. Yeah. You know, and I've got a tiny backyard nursery that's tiny. Um, yeah. but And they're crammed together and really tight. But I make sure that the ones that are specimen grade or have their special place, they have enough room for everybody. But then around those are packed little shohines and mid-sized trees so that they don't shade each other out and they have room for everybody to grow. It's, it's quite fun to take them and put them away for winter. You guys have the luxury of not putting anything away except for tropicals for winter. Yep. Me, it's a one man game of put everything on a cart, move it here, move oh, it yeah. there. And I'm sure it takes you like a couple wood. hours too. <laughs> oh no, okay, so I understand. A couple it. days. <laughs> yeah, a couple days. So one man. I was still getting them out of the greenhouse when I left to come here. <laughs> one man, 600 trees, two days, guys. Yeah, and at some, least. And I've heard other nurseries with full crews, if they've got thousands yeah. to take care of, yeah. that takes them a full 24 hours or more oh, yeah. of work, uh, just getting those trees moved around. Pushing them and putting them here and there and moving so, all these giant trees. You so know? for the, those of you who just have about 20 to 40 trees in your yard, then... You got it. You got it easy, but uh, they're they're on the right track, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I do it because I'm I'm 
I grow trees, I collect and design, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some trees I sell, some trees are designated mine, you know, and yeah, I, yeah. then I've got probably about a dozen client trees that hang you out know, with you. We're in bad health and yeah. they're, they're regaining health, et cetera, et cetera. And so they all add up and, you know, then there's all those cuttings that you do. You just can't throw away that piece of Kingsville boxwood or something that you really like a whole lot especially when it makes such a gorgeous little tiny tree if you can make it into a good cutting. And so they wind up coming into accumulation of hundreds of trees uh, very quickly. And before you know it, you're just, you're not willing to get rid of all of them. <laughs> yeah. and, that's, and that's Dana Quarterbaum's 101 How to Accumulate Mass uh, <laughs> yeah. and Bone Make side. lots of cuttings. <laughs> Make cuttings and don't waste anything. Yes, don't waste anything. Um, that is absolutely I almost right. forgot. We have, a, we have a live stream going on with the chat and everything. Is there any questions in the chat or anything of note? Somebody Quadalbaum bonsai, whatever that is. That's my wife. <laughs> Count again, she said. <laughs> so it might be more or it less. It might be more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still haven't completed moving everything. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's not all, you it's know, not done just yet. there yet. <laughs> so this is the same, you know George. Yeah. So fire ant killer, what's he want to know about it? How do you mix it? What proportions? So how do you apply it? Uh, how's, how's it applied, basically, fire ant killer? Uh, that's a 50% acephate you can get, like Home Depot, black bottle, orange top. That is normally a tablespoon per gallon if it's wettable powder. If it's only used as a granular, which I'm pretty sure that's a wettable powder because I've used it that way before. And then liquid drench your soil. Like if you have the mealy bugs, the soil mealy bugs in anything, and they transfer, you know, they just don't hit cypress. They like crab apple. They like anything oh, yeah. in the apple family. Oh, yeah, they take family. a tour of your, of your Oh, nursery. yeah, they get there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's on the ground or on the table. They'll find it. Don't worry. Uh, that's what I use to kill those guys. So acephate is a real good use on most anything. You can spray it on your plants when you have spider mites, but you have to use it three consecutive weeks, once every seven days to kill the adults, juveniles, and the eggs as well. And this is the same acephate that you use to dip bald cypresses in? The, the ones that you dip bald cypress in, the ones that you spread on the ant, fire ant hills around the so, place here. So the, the short qu answer to the question is apply bi-weekly, basically? Uh, every seven days if you got spider mites. Every seven days, so every if weekly. If you got spider mites, but okay. you don't apply it to the roots there, you would spray that. Okay, so mix it, mix yes. it and dilute it. And right. what was One that? One tablespoon per gallon water. There you go. You know, yeah. it'll liquefy and then pump up sprayer. Psst, yeah. Do your thing. It's not a terrible chemical. I've used it for many years. You so know. what's your thought process on like some of these heavier trunks? So these, that right there? Yeah. That's Because uh, I call that a trunk because it's so heavy. It's, you know, it's really a, just an upward kind of branch like you would see in a, any deciduous tree. And that's so you, okay. So you like that? I, I'm, I'm not opposed to it at all because the other reason, there's not much in here. There's mm -hmm. nothing in between it and the top. So therefore, you can use it as a secondary trunk, but to, it's also just a kind branch. Of, we're going to build this in Build that in to its own little dome, so to speak. Uh, but right now, what I want to do is get this guy out here. <laughs> Watch <laughs> out, man. I didn't want to poke you in the eye. But I'm looking for an anchor branch for it. Yeah, and I think I found it. It's going to be up the trunk a little ways, but I wire a lot differently than most people. You saw that on the Cypress, that I don't connect around the trunk very often. Okay. I don't ever go around the trunk all the way. So, and you mean as far as? Wrapping the wire completely yeah. around in a spiral. So what, yeah, so what Dana's meaning is like, he'll come, he'll just go straight from one branch to the other. Uh -huh. And I've talked about that with, um, I do that on winged elm and I do that on parsley hawthorn because I if do you that get on a everything and you yeah on deciduous <laughs> trees it's good because paper thin bark yes or plate Thank plated you. barks that uh that are hard to grow back on deciduous trees like a oh yeah like a winged elm or a, or a hackberry oh, and they start goodness. getting that thick bark nice little flaky plated oh and bark um on there. It's and pretty. uh liquid uh, liquid amber the uh, oh, sweet, yeah, gum sweet gum too if you get that quick that thick plated stuff on there and you put that right, wire across me. you don't mean when you cut I'll it hold it right there it'd be perfect yeah i'll just yeah. hold it for you yeah, so if yeah if you on that. if you if you pull that wire across that bark 
you're more li liable to scar it, to break off that valuable old platedness. Yep. So Dana is doing what I pretty much do with, uh, with like you said, the majority of stuff right. is you run anchor branch to anchor branch. Yes. Um, and then I'll, I'll hold that wire when I'm bending the branch. I don't know if you saw me doing that yesterday or not, but I'll, if it tends to move and it will, yeah. um, I'll hold that wire in place while I'm bending the branch around. But, and I've got you down here. Oh yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to pop that on there. And let me spin it a little more. And uh, I noticed too that, that, that you've applied your wire looser. Oh yeah. Okay. Much more loosely than most people will. Yeah. And see, I'm bending this branch on down while I'm doing the wiring. That way I don't have to bend it with the wire on it and be done with it, man. And then you can go ahead and apply your movement to the branch. Yeah. Like All after you have bend it down. Yeah. After, after uh, usually I will wire them down kind of into a quadrant that I want them to occupy, but I will finish wire and finish bending after most everything's wired up. Yeah. So that I don't have to go, well, I'm going to wire this one this way, and then everything winds up being, mm, I need and to you, adjust it just a hair. And you got a pretty serious little bend off of that just uh -huh. now. And this yeah. is something that's a little little worrisome with some species because right. they can be brittle at that, at that spot oh, in the fulcrum yeah, right, right there. right down there. But yeah. these guys here, American hornbeams are so flexible. They really are when they're young like this. Now, if this branch was as big as my thumb, I wouldn't even attempt it. That would crack would right cut off. Cut it right off and yeah. go for a smaller guy. It's no worries. So like uh, this right here would never like bend. That, that guy right there, uh, propping it is all I could do. That's what I would really recommend with that, putting a prop on it. You don't think anything like a, uh, like a guy wire over time? Well, I mean, if you put a prop in between here and here. Oh, a prop, so yeah. yeah. You just pop, prop it in between there like that and push it away from it after you've wired all of your smaller yeah. broom head over there. That reminds me of, because uh, we did work on a Primna japonica together, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there, that's what you did <laughs> with that bamboo stick. Yep. Yep, yep. that was that a prop. That was fun, man. That was fun. That was a nice little tree. If you guys want to, there's a blog post on the website, Underhill Bonsai. It's, un, it's uh, under the, the spring work chaos part one. And <laughs> I like that. That's a good name for that. Yeah. And then I had another post that was preceded by, it was uh, about the uh, Japonica. The, oh, I'm calling it Japonica. We had a debate earlier I last don't know. night. I think, I think you're right on that one. Yeah, it's a little weird, but we're not talking about that tree in particular. No. But, but it's also like comes down to cultivars and stuff. I was like, is this, is this musk maple a micro... Microphylla. Microphylla, or is it a uh, Japonica? Japonica? It could be, <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's like while well, we were talking about the it ficus. It led into everything. The ficus uh, salicaria. Salicaria, and the, yes. the ficus nerifolia. And nerifolia. I've always called it nerifolia, but, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, I just enjoy trees, and if they want to <laughs> rename it, please let me know. I mean, that's something that. I don't it think really I'm, gets my goat because I've been calling Nerifolia Nerifolia forever. Now I got to call it by a new name. That's okay though. Um, but I want to know why. Oh well. And there's a whole story, another story behind that. Yeah, the, the Deadwood feature is going to be mainly in the back. Let's turn this around. Let me see something here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's going to be hard to see it. Maybe not. Maybe it won't be. If we can move that around there. Yeah, I think we can. So that, we still need to bring it down just a hair. There we go. Just trying to get that where it's not, if we had a little piece of something. Oh, you want to prop it up a little bit just more? Just a hair right here. I got here. you a little. Just a little thin piece of, yeah, perfect. Something for right there, just to kind of level that up. Perfect. That's it, that's it. And uh, did you want me to apply some wire on all these other little spindular? Spindular? Yeah, any, any of those guys you okay. feel like wiring, man? Yeah, jump on it. Yeah, let me get you a little the, further all through All the it. wiring is, uh, you know, watching people wire is like watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Oops. Some people some people will sit there and enjoy watching wiring like that, though. Uh, you joke right. about that. And some people really need to see what good wiring true, looks like. True. And, you know, it's, there's the difference between show wiring and structural wiring to begin your bone size adventure as a bonsai. Now, um, um, quick question really quick before you get too far into that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. So you got these branches coming out, two in each. This one here is gone. You're going to get rid of that yeah, one? Yeah, that one goes. So this is the branch. what about these two branches back Those here? Those two, go ahead and use this upper one. I'm going to use this one to anchor. 
Right? Yeah, you can use that one to anchor. Or what size? Three? Three. I would go here. Go onto this one? Yeah. Go all the way up to there. Okay. That way you've got plenty of stability between them. There, there's the end of the wire. Oh yeah, that's my uh, that's my good roll of that's wire. That's your can confusion you tell? wire, right? <laughs> <laughs> Confuse the artist to see where we're going with this wire. <laughs> that's okay. I opened some wire yesterday, and it was like, oh, the wire starts in the middle. The wire starts in the middle. How do you get it out of there? Finally, I found it buried in the on the top edge of this wire that was purchased, and I'm like, wow, that's Pretty interesting, it's supposed to be really strong wire and I think it was made in Korea, uh, which is always good wire, but Korean wire's always kind of got a bronze color to it. And it was much stronger than the dark wire that we're using, but sometimes that's not so good. You know why? Because you crush the tree putting it on. That's a problem. So we've got a lot of branches here and we don't need to wire and keep every one of them. Yeah, with the deciduous tree, I kind of I kind of go about it a way where it's like set the bones yes. and then cut and grow the rest. Well, you're going to twig wire a lot. Uh, okay, so you will go in and twig you, wire this you've tree. You've seen my, my ones I brought to the show in Baton Rouge Okay, uh, that had wire on some of them and some of them were dewired. But all those twigs, everything on it had been wired at one time or another. And it usually takes two to three wirings to get it where you want it to be. What do you need, gentlemen? What do you need, sir? Well, I'm just, you're not holding on to this branch. You're just, we're just using it as an anchor, right? Yes, okay. that's just an anchor. Right? So I'm just gonna cut it short. You can cut it short and let it go. Yeah. It's all good, all good. Now, okay. let's see here. I'm getting back to these little and branches you want, under here. You yeah, want some wire, wire on those? Stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, that was a big chunk of wire. Yeah, I, I was trying to get this down because I really wanted to play with this as like, as the this first is, branch. That's a tough one. Yeah. That's a tough piece to use. I mean, it, it, it's actually going to be the second branch, honestly. <laughs> this one's going to be the first because lower down, but that's okay. Um, and you saw, I was, what, what was he asking there, sir? Uh, Put well, some wire on up there, yep. Yeah, I'm just looking for, because Where usually- Where wire what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm usually looking to see uh, when I wire branches if I'm going to use them or not. And I don't want to, because this is kind of going for you right now. You're doing your design. I don't want to. I don't want to wire something and then the guy come by and go, "Well, I don't like that." Click. Yeah. <laughs> Cut it right off. Usually, well, when I collaborate with another person, mm -hmm. it's like, "Okay, well, I put that wire on there," and they're like, "Hey, uh, can you back that off a little bit?" <laughs> I need a carve right there, or I need to. Oh, nah. I can't see the trunk like that. Nah. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, when you're doing a workshop with anyone, if the artist tells you, "Why are every branch on this tree?" You know what's going to happen next. He's going to cut off three or four of those branches that you wired. Yeah. And the reason for that is to learn. Is to learn. You need to Good learn how to man. put the wire on the tree. That's right. And put it on as correctly as you can. Like I was saying, we're not doing show wiring right now. We're doing structural wiring. So if it's a little sloppy, if it's not so cute, it's okay. Yeah. But if you're going to a show, your wire cannot be sloppy. It cannot have overages, uh, big heavy wire uh, that's really obtrusive to the eye. You just can't have that because it's going to deduct points if they're judging your show. Bam, those five points, ten points went immediately away. So you just have to think along those lines when you're getting ready for things like a show and change your tree and have one that's ready way before time when you're getting ready to do a, a show tree and make your selection for which one you're taking to the show. So in a tree like this, honestly, how long do you think this tree will be? Uh, honestly, this tree in about seven years with somebody taking care of it. Now, five if you were really, really on it. Really if this was your baby. It. Yeah. If this was your baby and you were every time these twigs run out like this and you let them harden off and you put the wire on and you shaped them and you said, Mother Nature, I'm a deciduous tree. I'm growing upwards. I'm not a pine tree growing down. Then you're really going to have something that's twiggy. You saw the trees I had that had second and third twigs on them, yeah. on the branches. Those are less than five years in production. Wow. Four years, but. But you're on them. Fertilizing, fertilizing, yeah. throwing it. I mean, 
uh, thanks to my wife <laughs> using the Miracle Row hose and feeder, you know, they've really been fertilized well with that and gotten a lot of strong growth. Uh, but then uh, this year, we've gotten in our set up where we can use the uh, Harrells that I've been mentioning and it's a really good fertilizer but it's only commercially available you can't get it anywhere else so we're lucky with that and that is a really great little fertilizer that is slow release like y'all's and it's also does the same thing it slows down its release when it's above 90 degrees so you know like unlike I mean I hate to say it but unlike uh, chemicals like Osmocote, which dump everything when it says it's a three month fertilizer and you put it on in July, it's honestly about <laughs> uh, 45 days and it's and gone. And it goes quick yeah. because you're because that's the one thing we're talking about with releasing. uh with Osmocote versus a high grade yes. fer nursery fertilizer like we're using here is that Osmocote doesn't last as long as you think. Because and, and when you start watering, you're watering in the spring because you're they, we're getting hotter and hotter. Right, right. right. So you're increasing your water, and this and is your trees using more water too in the spring as well. And this is going to be for and this uh, a lot of these videos are really centered around the fact that we're using American grown trees like uh, the bald cypress and hornbeam yes, and whatnot. Yes, yes. And then also, uh, and we talked about this a little bit last night, Dana. Was right. that um, well, I'm, I'm a little bit more looking at the southeast range. Yes. So don't don't have this confused with places that are a little bit more arid or a little oh, bit no. a little bit yeah like southern, right. southern California or no, 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 no. Arizona or something no, or no no this is totally regional yeah this regional. Is regionally based on yes. these species and this fertilizer yes um, so so you get a lot of rainfall you get a lot of this and that and the other we and get a lot of rainfall here when that soil is wet already and you've got osmocote on it you got five. and it's ninety degrees out what you need a two two and a half oh no five well, this, okay. Is this the no? This is like uh, six. This is the six over here. This okay, so this would be a five. That's the five. Yeah, because um, this branch needs. Do you you feel like you need to move this branch? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I'll that, apply this five to this to and this one. Some. Yeah. Okay. So that we can work that out. But you but, were saying. Uh, what was I saying? We were talking about <laughs> regional stuff for trees. Yeah, That's man. That's what happens when you crest that fifty-five, guys. <laughs> Don't ever get past that. You know. Ha ha. Right. Uh, but yeah, when you're using something like Osmocote, it's rainy, 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 and you've got Osmocote on your plant and it's 90 something degrees and you're getting a big rain. Guess what? That Osmocote's already wet and with it being wet and hot, it releases doubly. So it's also not only not lasting very long, it's over fertilizing, even though you don't recognize it. And Nine times out of ten, guess what? The tree's not even going to tell you about it unless oh, it gets so over fertilized that it can have a reaction to it and burn the roots, maybe even perish due to being burned by something like that. In fact, that's happened to some clients of mine who had osmocote uh, overly done on their trees and, you know, killed one of the beautiful trees in his collection. It just happens. Um, so when that happens, hopefully you learn the extremely valuable lesson that it has brought you and not to do that in the future, how to change what you were doing. Oh, nice little spider. There's our little spider was making the web. Little jumping spider, it's all good. Yeah, we have a lot of those out here. <laughs> Take care of the aphids, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I had a number three, which we don't have here. Yeah, we had number three outside. I think I left it. Yeah, I think it's left over on the other side. So I'll use a double wire. Oh, wait. That. Oh, right. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. Right I know on what you're time. Talking about. Right on time, buddy. That'll hook me up. But yeah, you know, Osmocote and stuff, that, I've used it many years. We used it at the nursery where I worked for so long. And what I found was it releases way too much phosphorus. Now, I see something here that I don't like. And I actually like the way you've got this branch. Now that we've cleaned it up, we've gotten some of this stuff out of the way so we can see it more. Now let's, we're talking turn it, We're talking design now suddenly? We're talking design all of a sudden because I see something I want to talk about. Okay, it. go ahead. Yeah, you know, Osmocote, we can talk about that anytime. <laughs> you know, just don't use it too uh, oh, yeah, this is over my, the top. One of my favorite things. Yeah, I see what you're talking this about. This right here, see, it's, it's actually the angle of it is very good now that 
we've cleaned it up. We can see it better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in line nicely with this. It's going away just right. But what's wrong is this is too tall. Yeah. So we get rid of that part of it right there. That helps the whole tree's design out right there. Because this right here is cutting into the back area of the tree. This top here is cut. So we want to stop that top no taller than this. If we leave it this height, it's going to grow another 10 to 15 to 20 percent its present size. And doing that makes it overpower the next branch section of the tree. So we want to reduce that quite a bit. Plus, it's going towards the back of the tree. Don't like that. We want to bring it towards the front and show everybody what we're doing. So in order to make that better, we just shorten that up, leaving a little stub in front of our branches. Because if we take it all the way back to the branches, more than likely when we put our wire on and move it around, it'll pull right off of the shoulder of that branch. So we don't want that to happen. And, and okay. trust me, I've done that a million times. Oops, I didn't mean for that to happen, but okay. you, know, you live and learn. Stub right? up here. So what you got? do you think we should go ahead and, for the sake of how, how bad these can die back, there's a stub I'll here. That off. You yeah. wanna go ahead and take it off? Yeah, just, just okay. you know, cut yeah. it back about a half an inch above that. You need a saw for that. Yeah, I was about to say, you got the little hand saw. You got one right here, man. Thanks, sir. Yeah, let's move this one out of your way, so. Okay. Like so. And that wire down. There you go. Now I'll hold it for you. Okay. Be careful. I'm trying to get these wires. That's a 7 TPI. <laughs> nice and easy cut. I love yeah. these little silkies. They're awesome. Yeah, they are. You know, they make a 6 inch as well, which I have a 6 inch that I Beautiful carry sometimes. Cut. But yeah, that's the, the six inches of eight and a half TPI, which whenever I use them, I always clean the teeth like so afterwards, and it helps keep them sharper. Okay. If you clean the teeth out in them. That, I'll have to note on that because yeah. that's, that's <laughs> I go through that, a lot of those saws. <laughs> right, and it, it gets dull, and that's why it gets dull, because it's got that old tissue in there, and then you go to use it again, the tissues become hard and brittle, and it helps to dull out your saw blade. Let me get the which wire that saw blade. You can buy a brand new saw for the same price as that saw blade. It's crazy. But, you know, they're great little saws. And I like them a lot. Uh, but that 7 TPI means 7 teeth per inch, which is really a cor coarse cut. But as you see, for our purposes, it's plenty smooth. You don't have to do a lot of edging with that. Are you trying to get some more branch wires in there? Yeah, just... Just, you know, just to give it a little bit more play up here. Right. Cause I got, because this, this is one thing that's really great about this species, about American hornbeam, is they're alternating. Where did that go? Here we oh, go. what you look for? Uh, okay. Got it. Uh, the alternating growth on these trees makes oh, them yeah. easier to wire and also to directionally cut. Yep. Uh, for pruning and stuff. Yep. And so yep. back over here on this branch that I'm wiring out, we got two really good twigs. And I just want to hit them with wire for you so that oh, nice. they can be laid out. Because nice. one thing that I go, th I go through with wiring, since we're in the super early deve developmental stage, one of the things that really, really helps out whenever you're, you don't know what to do with a tree, I always tell people go in, put wire on just about every twig and branch you can get, mm -hmm. and lay it out where the sun can hit it. And look oh, at the yeah. top of your tree. If you look from the top down and you can see all those branches and all those twigs, then that means that tree's gonna use all those, it's yes. gonna get big solar panel actions yep. gonna go on. Yep. Healthy, happy tree, growing, longing, elongating uh, new shoots. And then when you step back and look at it, now, really you, gonna be something. now you've mm -hmm. combed out all of the tangled, confusing branches. Oh yeah. And you can decide what you need and you don't need. Uh, so yeah, that's a good starting point there. It makes it a lot easier for you to decide on what you're gonna cut off if you can see everything and see how it's developing. And the only way you can do that is exactly like you just said. Yep. Wire everything out and then make your decisions if they're really bugging you. You know, otherwise, if you've got it, just wire it out and enjoy your tree. Yeah. There's a lot to these. I mean. And we'll be cutting back a lot of the growth anyway to, oh, to uh, yeah. build taper into branches, branches. later on. Mm -hmm. So some of these long branches, this at home, I might leave it this long and let it continue to grow to fatten up, take the wire off in a month, six weeks, and then you're gonna get this branch out of that branch in one summer. 
But if you let it scar just a hair, it'll get that way faster even, but it's not gonna hurt it because these heal their wire scars a lot faster than yeah. Trident Maple. And Trident can Maple, you'll see, see it for years and years. This one, four to five years, you won't notice that had a wire scar. There, there's a serious wire scar from there. That's for me, serious. Trying to <laughs> That's a serious one too. I was trying to lay it out. And, yeah. and I'm looking at the wire scar, and this has been about a year since I've I've it's committed not that bad. Committed that crime. And it's, it's just one little spot right there that's a little little cut in good, but you know how to fix like that, right? Uh, you, you, you remember actually, how to fix that? Yeah, and I know where Dean is going Flatten is that it out. you actually take a knife mm -hmm. and really, really like gently go in there and just take off that Smooth sharp edge. Mm -hmm. And just like because it already is a scar. You can actually take this guy here and do it like so. Peel it down. Yeah, it is a, it's a scar already, so just yep. re-scar it. You're re-scarring it, and what it'll do is it'll start to heal over and be a flat wound instead of a raised wound. And all you're doing is scraping off the top cambium. That's it, and then seal it over. Just like so. And you're that not fixes cutting it. off any live veins no, or anything on that? not at all. You're just getting rid of that ridge, and if you get rid of that ridge, you won't see it in a couple of years. Now, question about the top of this. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's obviously going to need, need to be some thickening in this, right? Here? This whole piece. A little bit. Just it's, a little bit? It's, it's got a nice taper to this between this and here. Okay. So it was allowed to grow freely very well and make that. Because I've seen a lot of these with tiny little, little pinky size top. And this has got bigger than your thumb. Yeah. That's okay, but we still need to bring up a leader. And that's for that's my it. next question is. And I, so you got this one, one is this one probably because it's think, in the front. Okay, so I was wondering yeah. if this one was worth that's, keeping. Oh yeah, that's the new top. Okay. You know, uh, along with a couple so, of others, along with this guy here. I'm going to be know, if you really gentle. One, see, <laughs> if you use this one, this one makes you have this awkward cattywonker curve right here. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You use this one as the new top. Well, you could use it. And you come up over the top. So what are you so what but are you looking at as far as what I like for this is to just be a branch over here on itself filling in a void and this one coming up just a hair and crowning out the whole tree. So my question to you, Dana, too, is that formal, informal, upright, broom style, what do you see with this? Because it's a this challenging is a, piece. Kind of a combination tree. Yeah. I that's mean, what I figured. It's, it's got everything, you know, because you say Formal upright. What does that Formal mean? Formal upright <laughs> means exactly straight as a board. Extreme taper. It's got to be perfect. Branches got to be perfect. Everything's got to be perfect in it. This is never going to be perfect. So and even though it it's has a to straight be grown trunk, to they, be that. Yes, it would have to be grown into that or else you're not going to have it. So this being called a formal upright, you know, and it will be called that. And here, you want me to hit finish the end of that one? Yeah. Uh, it will be called that one because it's a straight trunk. Well, straight trunk doesn't mean formal upright. And yeah, I'm using this big wire going way out on this little twig, but that's called overwiring. <laughs> <laughs> I was and, finding a good anchor, but also being able to move that twig. You know, it, it yeah. works. Uh, it's not going to hurt the tree as long as you can apply it and then take it off. I would uh, say that's time. the third tool bit that's been dropped on camera. I just <laughs> well, thought about that. I did that. one, so hey, yeah, you that was had two. To join me, right? Yeah, <laughs> that know? was two for me, one for for yeah. Dana over here. <laughs> <laughs> she's so funny. Oh my goodness, she's gonna give us heck. Oh my. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Did we uh? Do we have any other questions or anything? I haven't really acquired the chat in a while but no remarks or anything oh, cool good good oh as long as people are enjoying the, the view <laughs> what's that and as long as people are enjoying the view and having a good time that's important yeah that's what it's all about i mean when your bonesaw makes you scratch your head and cry that's when it's time to go have a beer yeah <laughs> sit down and go back to them the next day uh give it a rest for a minute or two uh, all right oh, what's going on Don? hey Don. So oh, it's great to see her online. This right here, that might that might have been my branch. I should have gone to with this. But uh, that's are you going with the little, little yeah, the little top there. There you go. So and then these guys you need a couple of wires. Can there. be laid out. And we can get an instant crown uh -huh. out of that. Uh huh. It's cool. So that number two is what you need. Here's right here. Small. Oh, I, I fished some out of it earlier <laughs> just to make it easier. I to need deal to with. 
I need to design a wire caddy for myself. Oh, well, you know, I like those shopping baskets with a bamboo steak run through it. I was actually <laughs> going to mention that because I remember working with you and Dawn. It's like, yeah, that's one thing that she has. And I always really like that. Well, where do you think I got my design, Dr. Dawn? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, so, that's part if of it. If it works, it works. It doesn't matter what it is. If it works, it works. And that's how we do it. Well, yeah, sharing is caring and, and definitely in bonsai. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you can't pass on your information, then you're just a rotten person. You got to be able to do that with bonsai because we all need to learn more. I'm never going to stop learning as far as uh, bonsai is concerned uh, because if I do, I might as well kick the bucket and put oh, myself man. in the grave, you know, because uh, that dark, means but... I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Really, seriously, I'm yeah. not going to learn anymore. That's not true. I'm going to keep learning. That's why I uh, recently subscribed to publications again because I just want to keep up with everything that's going on in the world of bonsai. And, you know, kind of keep current. So what, uh, what magazine are you reading then? Uh, Bonsai Focus, uh, okay. you know, it's the, the continuation of Bonsai Today Saga 99, you know, um, <laughs> and everybody's in it that, you know, Mike Lane's got second article already. Yeah, I saw that. That's it's like, awesome. man, yeah. look at him. He's boogieing. Man. Oh yeah, that's when he a came, great thing. When he came over here and we did a little uh, sit down with him, he had, he was just about to get it his first publication that time. That was wow. last year. So yeah, he's gotten like two in the past year. Yep, it's I awesome. know. That's a, that's a lot of work on his behalf. Yeah. Um, certainly is because uh, doing a publication article or at any rate is a lot of work and time involved. All the photographs, all the critiquing of it, revisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just haven't had time to even think about it. You, normally when I have time to think, I'm probably falling asleep or, you know, taking time to watch it, the TV for a second or two, you know. So that's my, my normal thing there. But I really do need to do some more of that publication stuff. Because I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures that have not been Probably truly exposed. cleaned up, you know, and that sort of stuff. And I won't let it go out to anyone like Facebook or anybody because it's theirs when that happens. And I can't use it. So I want to keep that intact for me and my wife there so we have some something stuff. good to put out so it looks, got? i was just cleaning up the crotch branches yeah. and stuff um it looks like we've got a We're pretty good little laid out tree here right, right so it's so coming. tell us about it's coming your so it looks like we can actually lay all these branches out uh, and well. look at some kind of design i mean like you said this will be it's about kind of a combo tree seven years maybe oh, on this tree being yeah. here at the nursery uh because i've got a couple thousand to really develop at the same time. <laughs> so this one, it might have to go well, in the front so I can pay a little it, bit more it, attention. It needs to go to uh, someone's home that they take care of it and they yeah. wire it next year and they wire it the year after. Because every year in the first five years see of it. these it's trees back. development, they need a wiring of some type. You know, so that's what you gotta consider is we're not gonna wire it just this year. We're going to wire it next year. We're going to wire it the year after that. And it's not all this wiring. It's these little twigs out here that come on later. Those is what you'll be wiring later on. So that's how you saw those developed trees that I had that were four, four and a half years in development. And they had a lot of twigs on them because I spent four hours on this one, four hours on that one. Because <laughs> wiring these right here is the time consuming part of making a bonsai. Wiring the main branch is not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to do. Now, my one thing with this tree is that I, I really like that, that secondary type trunk that's coming off the side and how you spread those branches out. This guy? Yeah, it, makes, yeah. it, it really, really makes it feel natural. That brings it up. And then your other branch is your first branch. Are you going to do anything else with that? Is that going to stay about the same? I'm going to do a little work with that, but I need some small wire okay. to put on that guy there. Okay. And I can use the two. No problem. I can use the two. Uh, that piece, yeah. There okay. we go. And, you know, it'll just be a little heavy wire, but that's okay. The only Been issue there, that. that I'm seeing is that maybe this. And did you have this set? What's that? Did you have this set? I hadn't touched that, really. Okay. Because yeah. I was noticing that it's a little empty looking right above this deadwood feature <laughs> so i'm gonna try to cr i'm gonna try to slowly curve you kind of pull something in there to kind of make it focus yeah you know focus its attention to that because that's where the real action's happening is on that little piece of deadwood 
And so I'm gonna not I'm not gonna highlight it, but I will no. frame it. In. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, framing it so that we see that underneath it and it shows itself off. Yeah, that's yep. You, that's you the whole think, idea. You think very much like I do. Then I mean, you got to. It's yeah. It, that's part of its whole idea of the tree is to focus on this, something that might be considered a fault can become an advantage really easy and also a main feature of the tree. Here comes the problem with wiring heavy wire on a tiny branch. Crushing is it. Is holding it in place while the branch is being wired is very difficult sometimes. Ooh, so I see. we'll get that on there a little bit. A really great opportunity to bring this branch. So it's not pointing towards the viewer, but kind of bring yeah. it down a little bit. This one here. Which one? This one. I'm about to wire that one out. Okay. I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> this, this tree, I mean, you know, compared to what we brought in, this is becoming a bonsai. Yeah. I mean, and it might be two or three little branches that don't get wired right now, but it doesn't matter. I mean, this one here could be wired even. I'm about That's to wire what it out. <laughs> Good I'm, man. I'm getting on it right now. Good it's, man. Good it, man. You're not going to be able to see the trunk up here, but at least, oh, yeah. you know, we'll, at least we'll, it'll be we'll designed. We'll do some of that. We'll do some of that. We'll show it off. Just a hair. And as you see, someone will probably say, he's bending that with his wire pliers. Yes, I was. And the reason I do that is it's easier for me. And it's actually a wee bit easier on the tree for me to do that. So you're bending the, the wire the with wire. the wire pliers. Mm -hmm. You're not bending directly on the wood. No, the wood is the, not being touched at all. Yep. But I've been doing that for quite a number of years. So you're familiar with that. Yeah. So I it's, mean, it's just, it's so much easier. It's more of a touch and feel kind of, kind of technique. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, if you have your wire pliers and you're so used to using them and they're going to let you feel something, your left hand's gonna feel it. Mm -hmm. but your right hand's handling that wire plier. And also you're looking at it and you're also listening for any cracking noises or anything like that. Because that's also something that indicates, uh-oh, I'm Ease having back. an issue. Pull back on me a little bit. That's going to put that in that crotch and that needs to come out. There we go. Now, boy, I'd need a number one. <laughs> oh, I think I've got number one in that drawer. Over here? The second drawer. Third, third, third. I can't count sometimes. Ah, yay. Is it, is it number yeah, one? Yeah, man. You okay, got cool. number one in here. Super. That is awesome. That's my little now. play box of bonsai over there. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, What'd I might need some of that number one, too. Here we go, we can share. Da, da, da. Here you go. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, well, get the last piece, couple of pieces on here. And I'm not being super particular about wiring to the very end of each shoot, because right. like we said, they're going to clip a lot of those off. Or I'm going to, um, eventually, <laughs> when I'm trying to get the taper in my branches. <laughs> That's going to happen. You know, it, it's all no problem for me. I enjoy, you know, come into some place that I know someone's taking care of the trees very well. I mean, I look out here and I see so many nice trees and they're all really healthy and they're all pest free. You know, it tells a lot about what's going on around here. Um, you go into a place that's, you know, not so well taken care of and things like that. Normally the plants aren't going to be very healthy. So it kind of makes you go, well, maybe I should not buy something at this place and go on to the next place and see what's available. But you guys have got a really nice place to come and hang out and find some nice trees to take home and make more bonsai with. Yeah. I mean, lots of stock material. If you're looking for stock material, it's out there. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun with some really, really killer it's cypress trees today. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to be doing uh, awesome. <laughs> I'm going to be doing some more work with cypress trees here soon. Uh, I know I'm doing a follow follow up video to my flat top bald cypress instructional videos I did on YouTube, so that's mm. something to look out for. Um, so yeah, a lot of that stuff is really it's going to be really good. Uh, well, then we up. got these new things, you know the the uh, the snow grow technique, you know. Yeah, that's something. 
That now we were joking about how how soon do we start talking about that? I mean, but we'll anytime. But that's that's something that you know we save for a future event. So but it's going to be a, a real you know nail biter. <laughs> tell you what, we'll uh, we'll take the tree that you did that to today, and whenever it heals over, we'll get we'll use it as a good example. Yeah, do some more shaping here, and uh, so out. that'll come. Oh yeah, that that's just lovely stuff to look at in the nursery and watch it progress. You know, and hopefully it's everything works out perfect for that and grows so. into place within the time allotted. But you know, if it doesn't do it the first year, you just leave it to the second, and it's okay. So when I shape American hornbeam branches, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I put a lot of wiggle in them uh, yeah. because when I look out in Mother Nature, they've been broken, 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 broken and they regrow, regrow, regrow in many shapes and forms. Uh, when I go collecting, the most trees I've ever collected at one time was like 36 in one morning time uh, doing with me and my uh, young apprentice, Kyle Derrickson, who had a wonderful place to go collect hornbeams. From here to the end of the building, I'd collect three trees. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's bam, seen a bam, couple bam, spots bam, bam. like that here that are like that. This was just hundreds awesome. of them. That's that's one thing I was going to ask you earlier is, uh, so you were saying that these horn beams ours ours are going to be like in a wet area. Yes. Uh, it's not going to be in a, it's not going to be in standing water. No. It's going to be slightly higher up from that water area. Just a little bit. Yeah. And you guys have a lot of rocks. We have you've been nothing me, but rock. <laughs> you've been telling me a lot about that last night. You were saying how like going out there and pulling these horn beams literally off the rocks. Yes, they're, they're on rock and they're, the thing is when you're recollecting, you guys use some reciprocator saws, you know, cut around the roots and underneath and pops out with a nice ball. Yeah. Well, when we do that, or when I do that, I have to use a pickaxe, go around the roots and expose them and then get in there with the reciprocator and hopefully don't burn the saw blade up it's a rock that's underneath that root that you're trying to cut. Mm -hmm. And so it's always a challenge to get out there and work with those trees to get them out of the ground. Sometimes one tree's 20 minutes and it's big trunk and this tall. Then it's the next one is half an hour to 45 minutes for one that's half that size because it's really gotten in between the rocks. And that's something that you always have to consider here. You're not going to have that problem. I'm sorry, I know I'm behind the tree, but I'm doing a little shape here. Oh we no, have I'm, a little wire here, but that's okay. We'll leave it for now. Just watching you how you're coming in. And like, yeah, I can see how you're talking, like all the branches are sculpted out nice. They um, got to be curved. And, and so as soon as you're done doing that, we're gonna give the tree a nice 360 around real yeah, slow for yeah. the camera. I'm gonna do that right quick like with up here too. Okay, and do your thing Move man. around some of these guys. And this tree will be One available at the say, nursery too, so. Oh yeah, yeah. So he's not a, going home with this tree. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I told you about when if I brought more trees home, what would happen? Oh yeah. <laughs> I bet you there's a comment on that one, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Mm, don't tell about Japanese maple, okay? Okay. Yeah. I didn't. We didn't talk about a uh, an interesting <laughs> uh, sport Japanese maple or anything oh, no. that you might need. Beautiful. I need that, man. <laughs> you know, you need that tree. You really need that tree. Let's see where we're at here. And you know, I'm I'm tipping these branches up a little bit. These are a little long, but that's okay. We're gonna leave them a little long. They got more power if they're long. Um, they get. A stronger tree really quick if they got a little bit of length left to them because what they have tip hormone in that branch that is telling the roots kick us some more sugars carbohydrates up and back and forth and I'm gonna send you some down so let's go and that's mm -hmm. why I tilt them up a lot on these guys the other is the design aspect yeah because deciduous trees naturally lift yes they naturally lift themselves up and there's good spacing on even in, even on the twigs here. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, this tree's got. I mean, it it really didn't. You didn't think much of it when you saw it, without it being worked up a little bit, you know. But once it gets worked up, there's a lot more here. Now we we'll like to trim these right there, You're because they're. Right in front I of know. The I'm sorry. <laughs> right in front of the camera. Yeah. Showing my back. Sorry. It's okay. 
But we got. You were this. looking at it against that black backdrop. Yes, so that's, you can see that's it. what I was doing. <laughs> you know it, don't you? And then that right there. We're getting real close to the end here. No, you're good. Right there. Oh, you're right on time, Dana. Awesome. Yeah. Well, not without your help, young man. That's and for we, sure. we got some time to kind of chat about it a little bit too, if there's any more remarks uh, in there yeah. about in the chat, or if there's uh, or if there's anything you feel like you need to say any about uh, about these guys. I mean, the, they're just great trees for bonsai. They really are. I mean, there's a few trees in the Japanese market that is. You know, the, everybody wants to have a Japanese tree, blah, 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 blah. But there's a lot of trees that are so-called Japanese varieties that are very difficult to grow as well. Don't let something that's a difficult tree or a little bit of a challenge stop you from continuing to work with it. Um, like I was saying before, when you're watering your pots, when you're watering your trees, I'm going to back up just a hair, take a look at it. Would you turn just a, this way for me? Right here. Okay, um, because if you give up on the tree, then you might as well give up on bonsai. And we don't want that. We want everybody to have a great time doing bonsai. And if it's difficult, make some calls. Talk to some buddies, go to the club. Uh, see what they got to say about what you're considering, what, to, what you're thinking about working with this tree and that tree. Maybe you get a different idea about what you're working on. So. You feel good with this yeah, design? Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty confident that's, that's a nice little tree, man. Nice little tree. We'll spin it real slow. So yeah. where's your, uh, use your chopstick. You got a piece of uh, chopstick. Yeah, 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 we found something around here. Huh. We'll kind of- One right here. Just stick it where your front is. And then we'll, we'll call it there for your design. They always want to get on a root and move the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> when you're putting it in there. Dang it. There we go. Now. So, right, right there. That's Dana's mm -hmm. front there. And I'm gonna turn it all the way around, 360 it, just so you guys can see how, see the beautiful uh, branch layout that he did for That's this a tree. Very good tree. Yeah. I and mean, you know, all considered, how many trees did we look at? We probably looked at probably 20 or so. Yeah. <laughs> and this was the last one, the very last one. I'm, well, that one's really full. And then I felt up the, down the trunk. It's got branches in the middle. Yes, because yeah. these will sprout one branch here and one branch there. What do you do at that point? And we've talked about this before. Graft it. Yeah. Let a long, shine branch grow actually... and zip it through the other side of the tree, making sure that you make a great contact between the shine piece and the exit hole, and the exit hole being very, very clean then it will take, if it's got a dirty cut on the exit hole, if it's not making good contact at the top of the exit hole with your shine, it will not take that year especially. The other important aspect is, for those of you who don't know what a shine is, it's the branch that sacrifices itself to lend the graft material to the tree. Well, when you put that shine through, anything that's on the inside from the branch donation to the trunk itself, anything that grows off of that shine will stop your new graft from taking over here. So consider this, put masking tape on it all the way from where it starts off the branch that you're using all the way to the trunk and hide it from the sun. Hide that shine from the sun because if you don't, this branch over here will just die off because, hey, I grew over here. Why did I need to grow over there? Very simple and very easy to fix a problem like that. But that's the only way I've found to make these hornbeams have branches because sometimes they will sprout one branch here, one branch there, mm -hmm. and then you're looking at a dead side lay, later on in the future, or you kind of figure out what to do next is to graft it. And thread grafting is so easy. It's about the easiest graft you could ever attempt to do and if you fail a couple times just try it a third and a fourth time you'll get it eventually yeah. and if you need to know how to exactly do it come out here and visit Evan when he knows it's thread grafting season which is well anytime you, usually any time of the year <laughs> because you want to do you it got material when it's active too we and we had another mm -hmm. tree that I was gonna pull up here and show about yeah. like doing that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but it's so. this one's got a beautiful <laughs> beautiful twist on it but yeah look at the 
Yeah, it's already carp. dying down the trunk. It's already dead all the way to here. Yeah. You see the black things? Yeah, little that's black bumps. Indication that's an indication. Of, mm hmm. Yeah. You just peel through that, there's going to be a little skinny dead spot all the way down there, maybe even in the base itself. And in another year or so, it'll just collapse and there'll be nothing there. Uh, but this is typical of American hornbeam, especially if it's cut short first out and it doesn't have a big die off in the initial uh, stage of the game, what it'll do is grow all this stuff, but it'll never grow anything else. Yeah, so in that case, this is the Cheyenne branch. We bring it around, put it through, and there was another branch right here. Really simple and easy, uh, but getting to that point, how do I secure it, how do I do all this, that's a whole nother program. Yep. That's, that's a whole entire that, another program. And that might be something I can do for like a follow-up video. Yeah. Is I'll take maybe the, even this tree's a good candidate. And I know that as there's... As long as you've got two sides with living cambium, yep. you can go for so that. So I have to hit it at least in here and at least in here. Because where I can feel the muscling on this trunk on the First backside. and foremost, find the dead spot. <laughs> yep. And I might even go in there, like you said, I and mean, take look at this disc. side. Look at this side of the tree. Look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. Look at that movement. Just a beautiful sway to it, and, how many and then nothing you, there, you know? How many branches would you want to see through? At here? least two, you at know, one two. here, one here, a back branch, but you probably don't have any cambium back there to make one connect and grow. Mm -hmm. But if you do, it, you can even have a dead spot in a little V and go beside that dead spot. As long as it's got cambium and phloem on both sides, entry and exit, it's good to go. Yep. So I would use it and make, make a better tree out of it by grafting. Uh, now, I will say, American hornbeam usually takes two years to set a thread to graft. To totally set a thread graft. But if it's allowed to have those suckers grow on the Cheyenne, as I've pointed out to you, it will not take even in two years because the approach or the thread graft will not take at all. It will die off on the exit side, and that's it. So anyway, okay. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's a lot more information than we thought we were going to get through for American Hornbeam uh, this evening. But thank I you so it. much for for being it, out here, Dana. Um, and that was Third Thursday Live, and uh, this was Dana Quarterbaum. If y'all want to check him out, he does have a Facebook page. Uh, it's Quarterbaum Bonsai Nursery. Yep, you can find it on Facebook. Facebook. Do you have mm -hmm. a website or anything? No website. Not just now. just look up the the Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, that's plenty of if stuff. If they want right to contact there. you, just kind of shoot you a message. Our oh, email is yeah. probably better. Huh? They can email us at Quarterbaum Bonsai at gmail.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I'm Evan with Underhill Bonsai, and this was Third Thursday. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks for watching the video, guys. Uh, don't, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, and look for more Underhill Boneside content in the future.